right, good evening. If you have your Bibles, please flip them open to Revelation chapter 2. And uh, this is a really cool place. If you haven't been with us in Revelation, this is a good time to come because we are shifting gears, right? The new topic is on the horizon. So in Revelation chapter 1, John is given an outline of how this book is to go. And the outline is in verse 19 of chapter 1, write the things which you have seen. That would be the revelation of Jesus and his glory. And the things which are, which is the section we're going to be in tonight and for probably the next couple weeks. And the things which will take place after this, which would be uh, the things that will take place after this. That's the future or prophetic part of the book of Revelation, which we'll get into uh, once again, probably in a couple weeks or a couple months, maybe. Aren't you optimistic? Yeah. <laughs> hey, man, seven churches, seven weeks. We got this. <laughs> Not if I have anything to yeah. say about it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we are now transitioning into specific letters to seven specific churches that would outline the area that we today would know as Turkey. Uh, back in the day, it was called Asia Minor. But these churches would kind of outline the area around Turkey, beginning with the church at Ephesus. So, so Sean, uh, real quick, is there any idea of like why these seven churches were specifically chosen? Well, they were chosen, that of which we can be certain. But regarding these specific locations, there's been speculation that it was to be nice to the mailman. They all go along the same trade route. But what's significant as well is there are some churches that they glossed over. Laodicea, for example, was one of the churches alongside of Colossae, and we didn't get a second Colossians in that regard. Ephesus obviously has already had a letter from the Apostle Paul, yet Jesus writes to them here again. We don't call that two Ephesians. But when it comes to these specific churches, there's a lot of different theories as to the significance of that. And so that you can walk away with more information to sort out than less, uh, we'll give you the different perspectives, and you can pray about it on your own time, and we'll give our opinion. But we also don't want to stand up here authoritatively and say, this is the answer when we don't know that. We want to make sure that we're telling the truth in love. So starting with the churches as far as an overview, the first and not as common opinion is that this is a prophetic overview of the spirit of the church. This is just describing the state in which people will find themselves spiritually at any place in the church age, that you could be individually or as a group, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Lardis, you get the idea. And they would also point to the significance, the reason for this being, the number seven. The number seven is usually associated in the Bible with completion or the totality of something, seven days in a week, seven notes in a piano, seven colors in a spectrum. The Bible specifically notes that God completed his work on the seventh day in Genesis 1, start to Genesis 2, and so we take that as a note going forward. The interesting thing about this as well is when we're talking about the seven churches, we give Jesus enough credit to have chosen these for a reason, which I think is fair, and also noting as well that there are Old Testament examples of this kind of interpretation being used. For example, in Joel 2, 28 through 32, uh, Israel is being addressed specifically during the time of the prophet Joel about a plague of locusts and why that was happening. And God promised restoration from that plague if they turned back to him. And then yet, for whatever reason, Paul the Apostle quotes that in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, as applying to all of mankind, that salvation is available and restoration for the years the locusts have eaten, so to speak. But that would be the first opinion. Now, the problem with this and we're going to acknowledge it. The problem with this interpretation is this is using a uh, style of study called uh, gematria, I believe is the word. Uh, the significance of numbers and emphasizing them sometimes tends to take away from the letters, and we want to make sure that we don't confuse the two. So take when you hear, oh, 13 is the number of Satan, or 8 is the number of Jesus, or 7 the number of holiness, with a grain of salt. Some of them have more credit than others, but when they would use that method of interpretation, it's not perfect, and we'll acknowledge that. The second theory people have as to why the seven churches is because it's a historical summary and overview 
of the seven stages of time that the church would go through leading into the tribulation, that this is a timeline, so to speak, the Ephesus timeline usually associated with the time of the apostles in the early church, the Galatian heresy, the Gnostic heresy, all that stuff. The Smyrna period would be the persecution of the Roman emperors, some overlap, which is the debate about all of this. The universal church is the church of Pergamos. The Dark Ages would be the Church of Thyatira, Sardis would be the Reformation, the uh, Church of Philadelphia, the Great Awakening, and then finally the modern church, Laodicea. But with all of this being said, we also have to ask the question, not just have you spelled this out for us, but why? Did you just come up with this, or is there a reason? And we want to give you those. The reason is because hindsight is 2020. We look at church history, we look at the letters to the seven churches, and we note some appropriate parallels, but not a lot. And this is what leads us to the problem with this interpretation. While it is brought forward by Bible teachers that we know and love, and while they are going to put this out there as a potential handling of the text, it's also important to note that there is no established place in Scripture as to where these things are. We're taking that on ourselves. And it's also important to notice the fruit of this sort of interpretation is usually only ever to point out the bad churches as everyone else, and we're the good church. We're Philadelphia, but all you Sardisans and, or Sardines or something, I don't know, you're, 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 you're out there. You've got to be more like us. We're the faithful church. I, I don't see a lot of good fruit in that. But note, I don't dismiss it either. We want to make sure that you hear both sides of this. And then finally, the third theory, and I think the most stable one, is that these letters are written to address these specific churches in the same way that the letters to the Romans through Philemon were also written to them, addressing where they're at spiritually, but make true statements about God as inspired by the Holy Spirit that apply to everybody, and we can handle them accordingly. This is part of the reason why we don't call the first letter, which we're going to discuss today, I think, to Ephesians, but also note in the same way, it's why we note that when handling anything in Scripture, the first and most important rule is, if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense, lest you believe in nonsense. And if you don't note the sing-song tone of that, just if it's plain, it's main. This is how it should be and ought to be handled. And we see that affirmed in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, what we believe, for proof and correction, knowing where and how to get back on track now that you've gotten off, instruction in righteousness, how to do the right thing in a right relationship with God, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now note, there's a problem with that interpretation too. In noting that if the New Testament has taught us anything about the old, diminishing the significance of a prophetic text, which Revelation undoubtedly is, is never a good idea, because we see a lot of examples in the New Testament that reference the old, and we have questions like, where are you getting that out of this? Well, the Holy Spirit spoke that with an intention, and obviously not one that we noticed at first. And we want to do our due diligence as your Bible teachers in making sure that there's enough room for God to speak what he spoke, not for us to speak and say God spoke it. Note the difference. So if you want to hear our opinion, and I'll be careful to clarify it as such, there's room for all three. The definition of the text certainly addresses Ephesus, which is the first church we're going to talk about, personally where they were at spiritually in the first century. Ephesus wasn't the only time Christians had these things going for or against them, and very easily applied to Jesus' words of correction during the introduction of the church age. So there are things that would ultimately outline these seven churches that apply in all three of these forms of interpretation, and I want you all to do your due diligence like we are in finding out where and when these methods of interpretation begin and where they should stop. Now, regarding this issue, where we can be certain is where we are, and that is in the things that are. We are presently in the church age, and as Jesus is speaking to the church age, we can not only receive this the same way we would any portion of Scripture, but specifically addressing us as those who are part of the church, of his bride, which we'll get more into in chapter 19. 
But continuing on with that point, and before we get into the text itself, um, anything more you want to note about those perspectives before we get into what kind of book we're reading so we handle the genre? Yeah, yeah. Uh, two quick takeaways that uh, before we jump right into the text and, and uh, really look into it in a way that God would want us to see it. The first thing is that, as Sean was talking about, when he was getting through this idea of the church age and all these other things, that the main sense is kind of the plain sense, that these were letters written to specific churches, to specific Christians at a specific time, and we should understand them as such. Now, I always find this really cool and interesting about God, that the majority of the way that God has chosen to delineate and show truth is through the lives of people as they've lived and existed in time. So, for instance, when you read, I don't know how many of you guys have tried to read uh, other religious texts, uh, like the Quran or something like that. They're difficult to get through. They're really, really tough. And I'm not saying that just because I believe they're false. I mean, it's just kind of difficult to read. Even guys like Sir Anthony Flew, uh, who was an atheist, right? He died a deist, but he was an atheist for most of his life. He said to read the Quran was a penance, uh, but to read the Bible is a pleasure. So th this is a guy who has no stake in the Bible being true or not, but he's saying, man, it's kind of tough to read the Quran. Why? Because if you ever pick it up, it's just a list of rules. It's just a list of do's and don'ts, and God says this and God says that. The Bible is actually kind of cool to read because it's told in narrative format. The majority of the Bible is like a story. And the reason why that's so important and applicable is because to know a truth, to hear it just spoken, is one thing. But when you see that truth played out and illustrated in real-life events, it really starts to make a lot more sense, and it starts to get fleshed out, and it starts to become more clear. So God has chosen to reveal His truth primarily in practicality and in time, because God's truth is practical and it is timeless. So it's, it's very cool, and I'm glad that God chose to reveal it that way. I'm glad the Bible isn't just a big list of do's and don'ts. That would be really annoying and kind of boring. And it also gives me a lot of hope because these churches who, you know, were in the first century, a lot of times Christians are like, we need to get back to first century Christianity. I'm like, you know, there's some good pros and cons to first century Christianity. Here are some first century churches. There's some good and there's some bad, right? They, they did some good stuff. They did some not so good stuff. And we see that people are people throughout time. They have good points and bad points. You're going to have good points. You're going to have bad points. There are things that you're doing very well for God, but you would be a fool to believe that you're not blind to a lot of other things. Uh, the vast, vast majority of Christians, you have to realize that the question of even something as, that we look at today as being so horrible, the question of slavery didn't even come across the minds of most Christians as being something antithetical to our belief systems until about, you know, the 1500s. That's radical. That's about 1,500 years of Christians not even talking about it. Are we going to look at all those Christians and say, you weren't really saved because you didn't think this was bad? No, it just means that they have blind spots. And, you know, one person pointed this out. He's like, the beauty of living in cancel culture is we live in the first age of truly perfected humans because we do nothing wrong, obviously. We finally figured it out, and therefore we could denigrate and tear down statues of everyone who came before us because we finally reached it. You guys live at perfect human time. If you didn't know that, now you do. <laughs> to believe that you don't have blind spots is to be that foolish, though. To believe that there aren't things that you think are totally right on today that your grandkids won't look back on and be like, I can't believe they thought that that was okay, right? There are things that we're blind to, and we need to be aware of that. And the final takeaway that I'll give you is, it's so funny to me as a pastor that I hear from a lot of people that I talk to when I say, hey, I'm a pastor. Most people are like, oh, you know, I'm always trying to get back into church, but, you know, I, you know, I have faith and things like that. And the idea, and I don't remember the statistics offhand, but the amount of people in my generation who think that it's not important to join a local body of believers and to be a Christian is astonishingly high. There are very, there's a large, large, large amount of people in our culture today who don't think it's an important part of your Christian faith to be a part or a member of a local gathering of believers. And they say, man, I got the Bible, isn't that enough? And I'm like, have, have you read the Bible? Do you, do you realize that pretty much the totality of the New Testament is addressed to local churches? 
right? The total, the, almost all of it. We only have one letter that was addressed to an individual, Philemon, right? All the other, even like when you say Timothy and Titus, they were addressed to the churches that Timothy and Titus were overseeing. That was the whole point of them. The, all the letters that you see in your New Testament, Romans, why, why is it called Romans? Because it's written to the church of Rome. That's why it's called Romans, right? God is addressing and he is administering to churches, local gatherings of believers. And if you notice, the description of Jesus in chapter 1 is he's walking in the midst of the churches. Being a part of a local body of believers is absolutely intricate to your relationship with God. Uh, I like what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said once about this idea of gathering together of Christians. As you guys don't know, Bonhoeffer was the pastor of a church in Germany when the Nazis took over, so he was in a persecuted church, and he wrote a book called Life Together, kind of as a quasi uh, <laughs> kind of rebuke of Western Christianity, where people are like, ah, oh, joining a local church isn't that important. He's like, when you're persecuted, it's important, and he gets into it in that book, and one of the things he mentions when he's talking about the importance of church, he's like, some will say, well, aren't these just kind of benefits, but they're not necessities? And he's like, woe to us if we deny a benefit that our Lord sought fit to build. So it's, it's important we understand this, right? If Jesus was like, hey, this is a benefit, and I'm going to build this, this is important to me, woe to you if you look at that and you say, well, it's just kind of a benefit, it's not really a need. Be careful. Be very, very careful about that. But I know I'm preaching to the choir because you all are in church. So <laughs> let's, uh, let's dive right in. Uh, Starting in verse 1 of chapter 2, uh, in the Old Testament style, believe it or not, of how God would speak through prophets, he used the same, essentially, sentence structure and says, to the angel, literally messenger, of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, Peter, as you mentioned before, we don't have to risk a speed reading accident and go very far to find out what those symbols are referencing. Go one verse prior. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now, paying careful attention to not only how Ephesus, but all seven churches are described, we won't get caught up in what's unfortunately become somewhat popular in saying some churches were saved and others needed to be saved. Jesus was still walking in the midst of them, and he doesn't go uninvited, so note that point. But when we're talking about and to a church, it's important to pay attention to how Jesus draws specific attention to its characteristics, to his glory, to how he appeared to the Apostle John, and as he's inspiring them to write, singles this one out and says, I'm the one who holds your teachers, your messengers, in my right hand, and I'm the one who's walking in your midst. Now, why would that be important? Well, what's key in this is to note we're speaking in the context, the genre of prophecy. And if this is what's being drawn attention to, we need to note that Jesus describing himself this way was as intentional as these churches being singled out. And just like the chapter noting in verses 12, 13, and 16 of Revelation chapter 1 doesn't let you finish without an explanation, it's also important to note his involvement in the church is a regular one. He wouldn't be there to begin with if these weren't his people. But yet he has words of correction for them. Now, isn't that the opposite of how we view relationships? If you love someone, then you approve of everything that they're doing, especially if you're perfect, noting the sarcasm again and social commentary. When we're talking about these letters, it's important to note this wasn't the first nor was it the last letter that was written to the church in Ephesus historically. But Jesus is speaking in this way for the same reason that Old Testament prophets spoke to nations like Edom, Tyre, Jerusalem even. And with these countries in mind and the time and setting that they were in, it's worth noting that Ephesus in particular was a big idol hub. If you remember in the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostle Paul had several 
positive encounters and engagements there. The crowd gathering together and shouting for hours on end, greatest Diana of the Ephesians, them threatening to kill him and almost succeeding, and continuing on with the persecution as not only Jews but Greeks were trying to silence the work of the gospel. The Christians were still living there when Paul left, and notice the lunatics and college graduates were still there when Paul left as well. And you need to pay attention to that in noting how Jesus is speaking to them, saying, hey, these crazies may be with you, but I'm here too. These false teachers may be opposing the gospel, but I hold your teacher in my right hand. So noting that point then and continuing on, let's go all the way to verse 6 and see what Jesus has to say. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, a lot is said there, and just like anything else in the Bible, not just genre-wise in prophecy, but speaking on behalf of God, which is what a prophet is, there are three things to look for whenever God speaks. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3, he who prophesies, right here, speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. Now, we see edification, which is literally the uh, teaching or giving people information that they need to know, the what of the matter, in that Jesus calls to mind the fact that they have left their first love. There is a problem here that you need to be aware of, that needs to be addressed. What is going on? And this uh, we'll get into in a little bit uh, regarding the significance of, there's also exhortation. He's encouraging or informing people of what they need to do, not just the what, but the how. And he mentions two things, repent from where they have fallen and do the first works. This is the exhortation, the encouragement to fall in line with the edification. And then finally, the comfort, which significantly came first. He is calming them or giving peace to those who need it, the why of this information. He mentions three things, Jesus knows their good works and the attitude they bring to it. They are testing false prophets, and they hate whatever the Nicolaitans were doing. Now, we'll cover the theories as to all of that in a moment, but when we start with the edification and the leaving of your first love, Peter, what is the significance of that? Yeah, before I dive into that, I, I just want this is kind of an aside, so you know, take it for what it is, but this is a this is a master class on how to counsel, right? So Jesus is our wonderful counselor, Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, if you ever want to know, as Sean said, in our culture today, usually correction is seen as a, an affront and a violence to do it to someone else. And we need to understand that, yeah, it is a good thing to confront, to rebuke, and to correct people. It says in Proverbs 27, verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. In other words, that if you are encouraging someone in sinful or wicked behavior, you're no friend to them. You're an enemy, right? You're, you're, you're deceiving them and bringing them into a path of ruin and destruction. But we also see that there's a correct way to correct people, right? So you shouldn't just bold-headedly go into things and just be like, you're, you're wrong, and just, and just go off on people. There is a way to do it, and here is a, I, I think it's a, it's a master class. It really is a master class on how to do this. So if you notice, he does something that I like to call a grace sandwich, right? And this is, you spend the first part building someone up. Man, you're, you're doing great. This is what you're doing great. I'm so proud of you in this. Like, this is awesome. And then on the bottom is also some grace. And you guys have also done this great. Then in the middle is the correction. But you're not doing so great here. And to point it out. The second thing that is in the correction, which is also important, is that there is helpful advice given. It's not just, you suck. It's, this is not great. This is how it could be better, right? Now, this is something, again, as a marriage counselor, I see it all the time. Because oftentimes, you know, there's, 
you know, unless you got a perfect marriage, there's going to be disagreement, there's going to be dispute within a marriage. And guess what? Your spouse is going to do stuff that is going to look really disgusting and evil to you. They're just sitting in their sin all day. They don't know how much it smells, but you do because you're not sitting in all day and you're like, that's really disgusting and you're going to point it out. And if you don't know how to do it correctly, you're going to create problems where there shouldn't be. Instead of being a helper to your partner and helping them deal with a lot of their sinful behavior, you're instead going to be someone who is critical, nagging, and diminutive to them. You're going to cut them down and um, demasculate them so that they'll never be able to get back up. You need to be very careful. So start off with some compliments. Hey, honey, you're really great at this and this and this. You're not so great here, but here's some helpful advice. Here's some things that you could try that would maybe be a little bit better. And then to encourage them at the end. And just ask yourself this question. How often do I follow this pattern? Or how often do I just come in guns a blazing? You just are so terrible. You don't care about me. And here's this and this and this and just go off. And then it turns into a, a shooting match when it probably shouldn't be. And you look at me and my wife, we just got into a fight last week. And it was so dumb. It was just like I was up in the room. My wife asked me to go look for something. I couldn't find it because I'm a guy and I'm bad at looking for things. And, you know, I, I was getting frustrated and I just yelled down the stairs like, I can't find it, you know. And she obviously takes offense because I'm yelling at her. and That's evil and bad. Right? She comes up and she's like, it's right here. And then I feel like I'm slighted. And I feel like she thinks I'm stupid. And so I come back and say, well, you should have told me it was there. Suppose it, and then we get into a fight. And it's dumb because the whole thing, again, could have been avoided if there was this understanding of grace, if there was this understanding of just like instead of when she came up, she could have been like, hey, you were doing a pretty good job, but you, you're an idiot because you missed it. You know, <laughs> and yeah, maybe, maybe try a little harder before you ask me for my help next time. But, you know, you're doing great. Or if I would have, instead of just yelling down the stairs to her, just walked down. I've been like, hey, you know, I can't find this thing. You know, I've been looking for it, things like that. You know, a, a soft answer turns away wrath. That is a very, very true statement. So this is true if you, if you want to correct your kids, if you want to correct your spouse, your partner. However, correction is good. Make sure you're doing it in a good way, though. All right, now let's t talk about the content a little bit. Leaving your first love. This is something where we need to find a balance on as Christians, okay? There are two sides where we can err on this. There are some Christians that don't really think much of the concept of love. Uh, I, by the way, fell into this category for many years of my life. And the argument goes something like this. God can't mean by love emotionality because emotionality is unpredictable and it's uncommandable, if that's a word. It's something that you can't expect from people because it's something that happens inside the heart. So therefore... When the Bible commands us to love, what it's actually commanding us to do is to obey. That's the, that's the commandment. That's the position I took. This section blows that out of the water because if you notice, the church of Ephesus didn't do anything that was disobedient. God's not pointing out anything physical that they're doing that's wrong. Whatever they're doing by leaving their first love must be happening in the inner man. If it was happening in the outer man, God would tell them how it was happening, but he doesn't. The second issue that people get to is, well, it's really just all emotionality, so it doesn't matter what you do physically, right? And this is kind of the perspective of our culture. Love is love, so it really doesn't matter what you're doing as long as it's out of a loving heart and you really have a genuine and sincere care and compassion for other people. It really doesn't matter what you do. You just kind of get a pass. That's, that's the idea there. So, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're being sanctified or purified before God in these specific areas of your life, but if you have warm fuzzies to him and you really love him, it really it just doesn't matter. God doesn't care. Be careful. Jesus shoots both of those perspectives out of the water. If it didn't matter what you did, then what purpose is it that Jesus spends the majority of his time focusing on complimenting them for the physical things they're doing? right? Your obedience to God and your submission to his word is important. It really is. God cares what you do with your body. He really does. We shouldn't just over-spiritualize Christianity and think that it's only relegated to the inner man, because it's not. What you do physically matters. It counts. God sees, and God cares about what you're doing. That's true. But if we were to say which one takes the edge, I think it's pretty clear spiritual, uh, biblically that the inner man is more important than the outer man. 
Jesus said to the Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and you call it clean, I have come to clean the inside. Right? When he talks about what the abominations are, he says what goes into a man does not defile him, but what comes out. For out of man comes abominations and blasphemies and anger, and he talks about all the, the evil things that you can do. Uh, and then also, great passage, 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, have not love, I am but a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and knowledge, have not love, it profits me nothing. Though I give all my goods to the poor and even my body to be burned, have not love, I am nothing. So clearly the inner man is more important to God if you were to, to, to level things, if you were to gradiate them. And here again, we see it. They're doing all these mighty works, but they've left their first love. The idea of having passion, zeal, tenderness, intimacy with God is something that passed them by. They forgot to do it. And anyone who's been in a long-term relationship, you know that this is an occupational hazard. It just is. When you first get into a relationship, it's new, it's fresh, it's passionate, it's zealous. I've never, ever, ever had to talk to a newly dating couple, or even some newlywed couples, depends, it's a weird culture we live in today, but you know, a newly dating couple and be like, be sure you text each other a lot. Be sure you're just like really gushy and you say that you like each other a lot, right? That, that's all they do. That, it just comes out the pores, you know? You have to, a lot of times you have to stop them. You'd be like, you guys are being gross. Like, I get it, you love each other, we all get it. You don't need to broadcast it and buy billboards. You know, just, just love each other internally is great. You have your private time, and that's awesome, too. Unfortunately, though, over time, the passion, the zeal, it starts to fade. And a lot of times what happens is we don't know how to get it back. And you have to understand that passion in the beginning is instinctive. Passion, as time goes, is intentional. So the original passion that you have in a relationship, that's just instinctive, just happens without thinking about it. If you want to continue to have passion, you have to be intentional about it. You have to be intentional about it because people get into ruts and they get into ruts fast. And they start thinking that the works that they're doing are tantamount to romance. And when someone points it out, usually the girl, the guy, I hate to be sexist, but it's just a fact, right? It's usually the girl being like, you haven't been romantic lately. The response of the man is usually, look at all the things I'm doing for you, thinking that the works equals romance, passion, intimacy, nearness. That's not true, and God is pointing it out to these people as well. You're doing these things great, but when was the last time you just sat with God? When was the last time you just spent time praying, thinking about how good he is, thinking about his beauty, worshiping him? being quiet with the Lord, right? When was the last time you legitimately remembered the goodness of God and were happy about it? Or has it all become intellectual for you? Or has it all become lifestyle for you? There's more to it than that. All worship and passion are developed through intentionality. You have to want it. You have to say, man, I'm going to stir it up. I'm going to focus on it. And if you think that seems, that seems opposite, I thought passion was totally spontaneous and it just kind of cam- comes out the pores. Wrong. That's not how it works. One of my favorite psalms that deals with the idea of passion towards God is Psalm 103. Beautiful psalm. You know how that psalm begins? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. He's looking at his inner man and he's saying, you're not praising God. You're not blessing God. What's going on? And he's speaking to himself and he's saying, we're going to praise God right now. I don't care what you're thinking. I don't care. He's talking to himself. He sounds a little crazy, but that's okay. Right? And he's just like, I don't care what you're thinking right now. I don't care what you're feeling right now. God is worthy. God is good. And we're going to spend some time honing in on that truth. And again, with your partner, if you're not uh, romance and love, it's the same, uh, same principle here. If you're not being intentional with your romance, it won't happen. It just won't. If you're not setting aside that time and intentionally saying, I'm going to push forward, I'm going to seek this out, I'm going to think about how good this person is, then it's not going to happen. And by the way, because women tend to be better than that in romance, in marriage, guess what? They're also better than that when it comes to God. If you were to ask my favorite book in the Bible, I love Jeremiah. It's my absolute favorite. In the New Testament, it's probably Romans. Okay? I love those books. Very intellectual, very heady books. My wife's favorite book, Song of Solomon. It's favorite book in the whole Bible. 
How often do I read the Song of Solomon? I think I, think I read it when we first got married. That was like six years ago. I, I go to back to the Song of Solomon very uh, sporadically. It's, it's not my go-to book when it comes to meditation on God. But for my wife, who understands passionate and zealous love for God, she is there all the time. And you know there's actually a section in Song of Solomon, I love it, where people challenge the Shulamite, who's the, the woman in the book. If you've never read it, please read it. It's really good. It's a really, really awesome book. But they challenge the Shulamite, and they're like, what's so good about your husband? And she has to defend his honor and his glory and his beauty, and it's really, really cool. Sometimes we become so entitled to beauty that we forget to appreciate it. And your partner, unless you're just an idiot and you married someone that you found to be terrible, which never happens, there is beauty in your partner. And just because bad things have started to creep up doesn't erase the fact that there are good things. And if you don't take minutes to appreciate the good, you become entitled to them and you become someone who doesn't care. So be careful how you treat this type of romance. Jesus seems to think leaving your first love is a bad thing. Right? It's a very bad thing. And it's something you need to be focused on, even to the point where he's saying, if you don't repent and do the first works, which I'll let you talk about, then I'm going to remove the lampstand from his place. And there's something bad that's going to happen uh, as a result of it. Yeah, you'll be incapable of holding up the light, what a lampstand does. But uh, continuing on with that point and just concluding, for those taking notes at home, understand how much love is a motivation, not just as an instruction, but motivation is to Jesus. Uh, when he was challenged in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six on what is the greatest commandment in the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbors yourself on this, all the law and the prophets. Again, Matthew 22, 36 through 40. But continuing on to his exhortation, he tells them, so how do you get back? How do you get, the, not the feelings, but the drive, the passion, the motivation back? Well, pretty much where you found it, starting with from where you've fallen and doing the first works. Well, what comes to mind when we hear works from Jesus? Well, I'd go to maybe what John, also the author, in John chapter 6 and verses 28 through 29, Jesus was asked, what, that we may, uh, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. And Paul goes on to clarify this in a, quite a sarcastic manner, believe it or not, in Galatians 3, 2 through 3, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? When it comes to our efforts in wanting to stir up motivation for God, we can do one of two things, delude or deceive ourselves which are synonyms, by the way. So there's one thing that we can do. But if, on the other hand, we acknowledge the fact that I have fallen and I can't get up, a life alert of a commercial in this case is going, Jesus, I trust you as my Savior. This is where we started. What reasons did I have to fall in love with you in the first place? It's a common uh, counselor's tactic as well during hopefully not post, but marital counseling. Why did you first get married in the first place? What is it that drew you to Jesus in the first place? For me, I'm a guy. He's the one that I could find safety, security, and respect from. You see him like a warlord. Hey, I like that. I'm a dude. But when it comes to people that are, you know, different than me, it's difficult for me to grasp, but understanding that as well, this is what we would all encourage you to draw attention to, not just in the glory or the majesty or the strength of Jesus, but maybe the gentleness, maybe the honesty, maybe the patience, <laughs> but noting that point as well. Which, uh, by the way, this is kind of interesting. As Sean said, we actually have a, a book, a whole letter to the church of Ephesus, and it's called the book of Ephesians, and we see that this is not a new problem for them, right? So when Paul wrote that letter, halfway through the book in Ephesians 3, he prays for them, and the prayer is very telling. He says, I pray that you with all the saints would be able to comprehend what is the width, the length, the depth, and height to know the love of God that surpasses all knowledge and understanding, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. There is a principle there that part of regaining or rekindling the first work of Christianity, as Sean pointed out, is not something that we've done, but accepting what Jesus did for us and understanding his love for us. In 1 John chapter 4, John says, this is love, not that we loved him, but that he first loved us 
He gave himself as a propitiation for our sins. And I love that you brought up the Galatians passage, how sometimes people can mistake the idea of this, that unconditional love and uh, receiving of it and mistake it for what am I giving back to God as a, as a measure of my love. Yeah, if you don't have passion for Jesus, acknowledge it. Say, Jesus, I don't love you like I know I should. Can I have that again? He's not going to be offended. He's not going to unfollow you. He's not going to not text back. And, and so. again, that's what Paul prays for the church at Ephesus. And there are many other passages. I love Psalm 90, verse 17, where he says, Satisfy us early in the morning with your steadfast love. Right. So if, if you're missing that in your life, you can pray for it. Yeah. Now, uh, because time's fleeting, uh, we'll have six more opportunities, if my math's correct, to discuss the topic of repentance, which Jesus will do for every church. Uh, not actually four more times, but uh, continuing on that point, um, Proverbs 28, 13 would be one that I'd recommend for reading on your own time. He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Repentance, metanoia in Greek, is literally a turning, and many church fathers throughout the ages have acknowledged fish swim, birds fly, Christians repent. It's a daily thing for us. Don't think it's a failure on your part. It's the first step to success. But regarding the comfort, um, I want to go more into this, but we don't have time. Uh, maybe ask on the radio program. We'll be happy to address it. But uh, Jesus, knowing their works and the attitude they bring with it, he uses the same language, believe it or not, the author of Hebrews does when telling them in a passage that's often taken out of context to say, I lost my salvation, saying, we know better things concerning you regarding salvation, the good works, the patience that you carry with it. I think that's phenomenal. Uh, also note, they're testing false prophets. Fantastic thing to do. You can't know the truth unless you can, or you can't spot a lie unless you know the truth, and vice versa. But uh, what I want to finish up with, two more things, is whatever the Nicolaitans were doing. There's three theories on this. I'll be brief. The first is a potential reference to Nicolaus, the deacon, who is in Acts 6 and verse 5. Um, he was one of the seven that were chosen alongside Stephen, if you remember. And according to some people who take this view, apparently he became a false teacher. We don't know. The second possibility is it's a reference to what will be repeated again and again in the book, those who in positions of church leadership will encourage false teaching, eat food sacrificed to idols, sexual immorality. We'll clarify what one of those is. Maybe you can figure out the second. But the third, and this is also interesting, is a possible reference to the name itself. Uh, Nico, like Nike, the shoe brand, it means conquer or victory. Uh, Nicolaites, the people, victory over the people or conquesting the people. It's a reference or a warning against those who would abuse spiritual authority in the church, and an example of this biblically would be in 3 John, chapter 3 John, verses 9 through 10. And the whole point is in all of this, regardless of the Nicolaitans, it's a commendable action for them. They're testing false teachers, and that can fit into any of those theories. They're working with patience, but they forgot why. And this is the whole crux of the matter, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 1, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. You want to be built up in knowledge, not puffed up, uh, you know, as a tendency to deflate when you microwave the marshmallow, make sure that there's something solid there. I don't know if any of you have done that. It's a lot more efficient with s'mores. But <laughs> segue over. Uh, let's finish with the last verse, verse 7. In Revelation chapter 2, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. A uh, free reason for hope preview for all of you here today, and then we'll finish. Uh, the tree of life is being spoken of here, and it's pretty consistently understood to refer to fellowship with God again. Uh, first of all, in Genesis 2 and verse 9, it mentions that this was created the moment man was created. This was synonymous with someone who could have fellowship with God. The tree of life is then mentioned in Genesis 3.24 as what mankind was separated from when they lost fellowship with God, and it's not mentioned again in the Bible until the new creation is detailed for us in Revelation 22 and verse 2, so uh, describing that restored relationship with God. This would be synonymous with heaven, this would be synonymous with eternal life, this would be synonymous with Jesus, having him. But with all of this being in mind, and considering that a worthy reward for repentance, is it? No. 
<laughs> no? <laughs> no. So uh, if you're talking about repentance, then uh, as the author of Hebrews put it, repentance from dead works, uh, meaning uh, turning away from the perspective that I can earn my way with God and turning instead to a mindset where I'm receiving forgiveness from God freely and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, then I would say, yeah. But if it's the concept of repentance from specific sinful actions and a complete uh, uh, change of behavior till you're completely holy. I would say that's something that we're all in the midst of, regardless of how far along in the Christian life we are. So it can't be a prerequisite for salvation. Not turning from, but turning to. He's the one that's calling out to Ephesians, and he's the one that's ultimately their reward. The tree of life's just a bonus. That's right. So the idea of overcoming here, uh, and we're going to see it a lot, it, it can almost be translated the idea of clinging to right? Uh, in, in light of what's going to be happening in the last days, the idea of people who cling to or adhere to the original truth that they heard of the gospel, these are the people who overcome, who make it to the garden. I love at the end of the book in Revelation 22, he says, let all who are thirsty come. And this is idea of who makes it into heaven, the thirsty, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for you will have eternal life. So the idea of those who thirst for God, who want him, and receive it freely. Those are the ones who will, who will make it in. Well, let's pray. I'll have Dave come up, and then we can all see how this will be applied in our lives. Dad, thank you that we have the chance to not only be in your word and hear what your spirit said to the church of Ephesus, and we take to heart the reality that our passion for you certainly will pale in comparison to when we see you face to face, but we don't want to wait for heaven. We want to experience you now. So in my own heart, as well as Peter's and all those gathered here, I pray that you would give us that first love again, that we would turn from the entitlement, the lethargy, and even the outright distraction that this world can be from your majesty, and remember that you're the one who walks in the midst of this church and celebrate that fact, that you're the one who holds us in your right hand, and we are thankful for that. And when it ultimately comes down to it, regardless of the commendations and corrections, I pray that we would recognize it as coming from your voice and that being good. And as we have the chance to apply this in our lives today, that you would be the prize, not just the things that come with you, but that we would do these things for you. We pray this all in the name of your son. Amen.